Okay. So our last uh, panel concludes our <coughs> lineup of public program talks today. Um, and this final talk is actually part of our Artisan Conversation series, which pairs together a number of artists from the Biennale together in order to instigate conversation and cultural discourse. So to, to end our evening, we have, I think everyone is on, um, we have Lulu Al Hamoud in conversation with Han Meng Yun, moderated by UCCA curator Neil Zhang. And enjoy. Hello, everyone. Um, so I'm, I'm Neil, and Lulua and Meng Yun. Um, it's really great to be here tonight, and there are many familiar faces in the crowd. Uh, that's great. Um, so, yeah, so as you all know, today, tonight, Lulua and Meng Yun, both of them are um, the artists in the section six of this banale. Uh, concerning the spiritual. So spiritual, spirituality, I think maybe is a great point to start the conversation tonight. Um, since this is a panel discussion, so at the first, I would like to take a, um, like a detour or a step back to really thinking about, you know, the question of like spirituality, like what does spirituality means? Or spirituality and religion, religious, what are the differences or combinator around those words? Um, but also, you know, whether religious art is a valid realm of, you know, for artists to do their work and production. So maybe we should start with those questions first before we jump into their work. Um, some of you might already see in the exhibition. So um, I would like to ask two artists, so for from your perspective, um, the word spirituality and religion, either what's the difference between those or you think is relatively the same? Okay. Um, hello everyone and thank you for coming. Um, I think there is a difference because I think religion is a way of life and it's practice. While spirituality is it's your, uh, it's your relation with the higher power, with God, with the divine and uh, a way of contemplation in nature and in everything around you, in your surrounding. So um, I think for me that's the difference. I, I don't know what uh, you... Um, it's a tough question. Um, I think when it comes to spirituality, it's a moment when language fails. Um, when my mouth shuts and the world starts to speak to me. Um, and that's a very sort of divine experience and a, a sense of communion with the world as a whole. Um, but when it comes to religion, I think a lot about language and the name of God or name of gods. Um, and when you talk about religion or any religion, there's a name to any god um, that people worship in that particular school of thought or a sect. Um, but when it comes to my case, um, I cannot think of a name for my god, or maybe the god or that, I don't know, or it's beyond language, and then I go back to spirituality. Um, so it sounds like both of you are describing spirituality as something that's relatively personal, doesn't really involve any uh, specific school of thoughts or any particular practice. It's more of like a spontaneous response to the nature, to, the, um, to anything that's outside of you. And so, but I also wondering, since when does the, this theme art come into the spirituality? Like, I would like to know for both of you, like, uh, whether our practice is the way for you to unpack the spirituality or is the way to discover it? I think when you unpack spirituality, you discover it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I, well, um, it's something I'll talk about later in my slides. Um, and you, can, you can start it now. <laughs> okay. 
I mean, because two of them, they prepare lots of slides. So I think, yeah. <laughs> Maybe it's a good way to start. Oh, no, go that way. Oh, no. Um, it's actually a long story. I'll keep it short. So um, I have to start from the very beginning of my education in the States. Uh, I'm Chinese. I was born in China and raised in China. And I received a very rigorous Soviet Union academic training in painting. Uh, prior to my studies in the States when I, um, like for undergrad. And then when I went to the States, I was so uh, shocked to see this kind of abstract expressionist painting that everybody's doing there. Um, and I couldn't understand what they are. But then I have to acknowledge that I feel so much in front of an abstract painting against an absence of words. And I think that was the moment when I realized that there's something larger than a manifest world, than what language can capture, than the self. And yeah, and then I started making abstract paintings in order to understand and fathom and comprehend that experience of um, being speechless in front of an abstract painting. Um, and of course, when you're in New York and you know uh, you have to deal with the legacy of the post-war American abstract painters, um, and then you know most people talk about spirituality in relation to abstraction. Um, but towards the end of my studies, I realized that this is not the kind of abstract painting that I should be doing. Um, the palette or the shapes don't speak so much to me. Um, as I grow more and more towards my own tradition, which is the Chinese one, I started to look at a lot of Chinese landscape painting and art of the calligraphy, for example, this one. And all of a sudden, I realized that this is abstract. The word is abstract. So I think maybe I will add one thing is, as for a, a Chinese, like we cannot read this. So this is unreadable. So. What's that? So we don't feel bad about it. Exactly, exactly. Don't feel bad about it. Because, you know, in Chinese calligraphy, there's, you know, many styles, like running style, cursive style. So it's actually, you know, in calligraphy, it's also linked to something we call, like, spiritual writing. Why it's called spiritual writing? Because, like, cursive style, I think this is, can count as a cursive st style, which is unreadable. Um, so the origin of this style uh, can be traced to this really famous Taoist uh, story, which means a deity like appears in front of a person and she say something to this person, like uh, uh, a truth. So the person have to write down really quickly the the truth that was given by the the deity. So because the person is writing really fast, so in the end, the end product of this almost like a script is has become another divine object rather than something that's you know just simply um, uh, information. So I think, yeah, so for this, I think um, it's interesting like you write down something, but no one can actually read it. So yeah, I think maybe Lua, you can also comment on some of this. I think in Islamic tradition, they're also similar. Um, yes, I think my work is also, uh, I was trying to create a language that cannot be read. It's just to feel the energy of, of the words that I'm creating uh, based on uh, geometry. Um, I think, it's interesting that she said that language is, uh, is spiritual itself, and it's an ab abstract uh, form of art. Yeah. Yes. Um, like when we think about language, for example, we call a flower flower, but the word flower has no meaning. And the flower itself also has no meaning. We, but we add the meaning to a flower w with language. Um, to give it a name, but then in the end it's rather futile. But then I guess we can say that it's, it's I don't know, one, it's our last resort in a way that we were desperately trying to figure out this unnameable, undefinable existence that surrounds us, or including ourselves. Um, and language is one of the ways to do that, to, to capture the essence, um, yeah. however much we fail. Um, yeah, so um, realizing the abstraction in calligraphy, um, I was thinking, mm, maybe that's something I can do. 
that might be very true to who I am as a person, as an artist. So I came up with a series of abstract paintings combining the Taoist uh, landscape painting, the kind of monochromatic uh, palette with the kind of expressionist uh, way of painting. For example, Jackson Pollock, you know, the drips, I was using wall paint. And I was just pouring, uh, pouring uh, paint on, on the floor, on the canvas uh, to allow uh, gravity manifest itself and also to kind of show a bodily, a physical, and even kind of a, a quality of, of dance uh, when one paints. So this is just one of them. Um, and then something I encountered in New York that really intrigued me, um, like these paintings come from India uh, in the seven, 17th century uh, from Rajasthan. And they were made for uh, meditation practices in order to envision gods, deities like uh, Shiva, Vishnu, Brahman, stuff like that. Um, and I was so shocked to encounter these paintings because they look just like Paul Clay and Agnes Martin and these like, you know, um, the precursors of abstract uh, expressionist people uh, in the West. And then that really kind of um, put me off uh, in thinking or developing this sus deep, deep suspicion of who invented abstraction in the first place? Where did it come from and why? Uh, what's the meaning, what's the relationship between abstraction and spirituality or religion? And is the kind of spirituality or spiritual art in the form of abstraction made uh, in the States authentic where they don't believe in anything? So, you know, I, my brain kind of exploded at that time and I couldn't find any answer to these questions. Um, I have a question for Meng Yun. So, like, as you described, those let's call it painting for now, those paintings have been used in a really specific religious practice or uh, context. Uh, but do you think calling those visual culture painting is okay or not? That's a very great question. When we talk about painting, it's a Western Euro you know, European word, painting. Uh, or even Haiban. art. Yeah. Um, but in, you know, in different languages, like in, in Chinese, hua, tu, so there's a difference between Painting, but then painting is also drawing in Chinese. Or image. Or image. So, you know, it's, they're completely different. And in, an, in the context of the, the Indian tradition, uh, in, they call it image, chitra. And it means an image. That can also mean the image of a sculpture, image of a boss relief. There's no difference between a painting, a relief, and a sculpture. And that also blew my mind. And then what is a painting if we think from a different system of thought and perspective? Um, so that's a very good question, and I and think... And also I think in Islamic tradition, all those <coughs> calligraphy, I think to call them like a decoration is also quite not accurate. Not at all. Exactly. Yes, and I've read so many books about Islamic art, and uh, the first thing when I read that it's that Muslim artists chose calligraphy and geometry because... Um, the figurative art is prohibited. I just close the book and I say, this is not correct. And most of the books talked about being decorative. I did not understand even the geometric patterns and, until I researched so much. And I saw how many sciences uh, are in, in the making of these uh, geometric patterns. It was unbelievable. Um, so, I think I got really fascinated. And I think the relation between uh, geometry and spirituality is because when we see geometry, we're actually realizing what God made. It is not a man-made thing. Geometry is not a man, it's, it's in nature. It's everywhere exactly. around us, uh, whether it's on the surface or, or maybe the hidden rules of the creation as well. From seed to flower, there is, a process with that can be traced with numbers and shapes. Yeah, in the way I think geometry, they're more universal. They're, exactly. They're, you know, like math, like one plus one equals two. This is universal. It can yes. cross culture, cross nation, cross, you know, like everything. Yes. I think, um, I mean, when I uh, read uh, the book of uh, um, Vasily Kandensky, who is one of my favorite painters, um, it was, uh, he had two books, the spiritual and art, concerning the spiritual and art, and 
point and line to plane. And when I read point and line to plane, it's almost exactly the same like the Islamic art principles. Because also Islamic art is, um, it's, it's, it was like a melting pot for different civilizations. They took from so many different cultures. They took from the Indian, they took from the Spanish, they took, and it's amazing how it got adapted by each culture. I think that fascinated me. Okay. Um, I, so, sorry. <laughs> I don't remember. Maybe you can flip to the next page, oh, okay. you can understand. <laughs> oh, okay, uh, I'll go back. <laughs> There's a, um, so uh, ever since I encountered this, I realized that there is a different system of thought or different systems of thought when it comes to making an image, either, whether it's a painted one or a drawn one or a written one. Um, and when I was in New York, I, I was trying to talk to everybody about this, uh, if you know anything about it, but you can't find anything about art like this in like an existing uh, art history book. Book, um, or even the so-called you know global arts history and uh, encyclopedia whatever um, and also there's so little about like you know Chinese art and stuff like that and I realized that this is not the place for me anymore I have to go uh, and I left and I went back to China and I started to study traditional art like calligraphy and painting I, I was reading a lot like Taoism like Laozi, Zhuangzi uh, and, and also Buddhism and then the more I learned, the more I realized that there's such a vast world in front of me that nobody really explored. Or they have explored, but it's not recognized in the contemporary art discourse. So I became more and more intrigued by Buddhism and I started to learn Sanskrit because I wanted to know what these ideas mean. Like what does uh, emptiness mean, shunyata, in its original language, in a verse. Um, I was so curious and compelled to, to know, to seek the truth. Uh, and then I studied Sanskrit in Japan, in, in Germany, and then in Oxford, uh, all over the world, in both secular and um, religious set and settings. Um, and then through Buddhism, it's very natural for me to encounter Hinduism. Uh, and then I became so interested in Indian culture and art at large. And through India, I learned about Islamic art, like the Mughal and everything. And then I became so interested in um, like Persian and like everything, uh, the whole world. Um, but I should talk about the next one. So uh, after learning a lot of Sanskrit and Buddhism, I started to think, and I, also, I did a lot of field trips across China uh, to visit these Buddhist sites. And I suddenly pay attention to the space that uh, shelters these uh, Buddhist statues. And I realized that the image needs a shelter, a temple, a space, that it's not an isolated object that is to be hung on the wall. Um, and so I was trying to figure out why I, I have such, uh, I experienced such powerful feeling uh, when I was in a Buddhist cave or in a temple. Um, so in order to understand that, just like I was trying to understand abstract painting, I decided to recreate a Buddhist uh, cave, which is this. And the work helped me understand the spatiality of the spiritual, uh, the, spiritual uh, the, the, the space of the mind. Um, anyway, I'll move on. And this is something that I just did uh, in Shanghai at the Westbound Art Fair and it's also an exploration of the Buddhist sort of, um, or a Hindu, like a pan-Indian and pan-Asian kind of architectural form. Uh, but this one is more in like a Chinese, classical Chinese wooden uh, structure. And then I, um, you know, kind of um, recreated a Buddhist cave ceiling with printed blocks uh, that I collected in India. And I was just trying to figure out the visual configuration of the cosmos, um, its grammar and its vocabulary, which are the prints, the motifs of the flower. And that is the language of the world. If, I don't know if you follow me, but 
Like, why, why are these fish and flowers painted in the caves? What well, are they? Are they just merely decorative? Are they just pretty? No, they are the elemental component of the world as much as we are. Um, and there's more to it, but I don't have time, so I have to go. <laughs> uh, and then I'm gonna like, quickly go to um, what, what I'm showing here at the biennial. So this is um, the Quran uh, at the, the National Museum here. And I was, this is something that captivated me in the past two years, the beauty of the book. Um, and just, just look at it, like, and, and, you know, like, and the, the kind of commonality between the Chinese culture and Islam, uh, Islamic art is uh, the beauty of the word that we both worship. Um, and I, as a Chinese, immediately respond to the beauty of the word when I didn't understand what it means. Um, and later, like, I, I completely respect my intuition and my fondness for the form of the, the Arabic script and, and to the point that I want to do it myself and learn the language. Um, and then I love the idea of the book being this, the perfect, perfect form that marries uh, image and word. It's like you can have everything in a, in a book. Um, and the Argentinian uh, writer Borges also envisions the heaven as a library. And the French philosopher Malarmé envisions the book being the container of the world or where the world comes into being and, and dies. And that really uh, had a huge impact on the way I perceive this medium and how can I work with the, the art of the book, the form of the book, and the language within, the compositional language between the blank space and what's been painted uh, and the decorative, um, I don't like decorative, this word, but the, the beautiful floral border, the illumination, and uh, what's been worshipped within. Um, and also thinking how you know the book, the form of the book captures the form of the mind, how the mind thinks, uh, moves around. And I was really uh, intrigued by the, uh, a, a miniature painting um, in a very typical sense. Uh, there's a fortress and stuff like that, people walking around. But what's very fascinating about that particular painting, too bad I didn't put it in there, is that the birds Fl were flying within the painted frame. At the same time, they fly outside of it. And what does that mean when the birds interact with the frame within that book? And how does that manifest the way people think? Uh, or how it's, it's a manifestation of the movement of consciousness, the boundary of consciousness. Um, Stuff like that. <laughs> okay, and then, you know, just looking at a lot of uh, Islamic manuscript, uh, the Persian, Arabic, and everything, and I started to develop a new language for painting. And while learning about this uh, new culture and its art form, um, I learned about this particular story written by the 12th century poet, Persian poet Nizami, um, in his Khamsa. There's a story that uh, talks about uh, Alexander the Great. Um, it's a fictional story. And he's having an argument with the Chinese emperor, also a random emperor. Um, and they're arguing about who's a better painter, the Chinese or the Greeks. Um, and then they decided to have a competition right away in the room, which is divided by the curtain. Uh, so the Greeks paint here, the Chinese paint here, which is kind of like in the painting. Um, and then once they're done, they unveil the curtain. And the empress were so surprised to see two identical paintings. Uh, there's no description of what the Greeks have painted, but upon closer observation of the Chinese painting, they realized that the Chinese didn't paint. They simply polished a mirror that reflects the painting across the room. <laughs> it's a fascinating story. Um, I was so intrigued. And I selected this particular story for the biennial because it's kind of a, it speaks directly to the kind of uh, collaborative nature of the biennial Saudis, working with you know, Chinese curators. And I find that really interesting. It's a form of enactment of history, in my mind. 
maybe the history is a fabricated or imaginary one, but still the story reveals so much of the historical connection and interaction between cultures, across cultures, not just the Chinese and Islam, but also the Greeks. Their relationship with uh, the Arab world, how the, you know, and then you know, there's a lot going on there, and then you know, like China and Islam and all of that. And I feel that this is something that we have always ignored in contemporary art. We don't talk about you know this kind of dialogue anymore. We only talk about China and the West or Arab and the West. But then we can talk too, and we have been talking for over a thousand years, if not more than that. So I think it's a very important story to to um, you know to retell and reinterpret. So that's why I chose the story, and I made a mirror pavilion um, based on this particular story. So that's the the work. Um, the work the. The, the middle structure is called the Pavilion of Three Mirrors. And in thinking about that story, it's so interesting to you know, think about the relationship between painting and a polished mirror. Painting being a mirror, what does that mean when painting is a mirror? What do you see in a painting? Uh, and what do you see in a mirror? Like what's that, how, how does that work? Um, yeah, and then like I, I realized that it's it's so profound to think about you know painting as a form of mirror that re it reflects the mind of the painter. The painting reflects the mind of a painter just as a, a mirror reflects my face or you know my my mood. Um, and then what's the third mirror in the pavilion? The third mirror is my mind the mind of the painter that reflects the world or a divine consciousness. Um, yeah, so the, those are the three mirrors. Uh, and then I tailor the, um, all the paintings based on a lot of uh, Islamic references like literature, the conference of the birds, and a lot of uh, uh, poems by Rumi, Hafiz, Saadi. Um, so you can see a few. Uh, I don't know if you can recognize the, my references, but. Oh, no, there. Um, and I guess we can go back to talking about language. So in the middle, uh, I, I guess you can understand. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's Persian. Um, it's the famous uh, kind of lover, uh, the nightingale and the rose, um, blue, blue, and gold. And I was just reading this book uh, about somebody writing about Borges again. Uh, he actually used a lot of Islamic themes in his writing, and I find it super fascinating, and um, how he believes, because he's blind, so he only lives in literature, he only live, lives in language, and the actual flower, the actual rose, and the actual nightingale mean nothing to him. But the nightingale and the rose in poetry and in literature are the actual ones for him, are the most authentic and powerful uh, beings and metaphors for him. So, and that's why th th it kind of inspired me uh, to think about, like I don't really know why I chose to write them in words instead of depicting them in, in form, because I realized that the, they carry meaning in language not so much in reality, in its form. It is the, the literature that redeem their value. Um, yeah. And I also want to talk about this particular painting. Um, it's, it's a triptych, though. Um, that one, it's a fascinating one. Um, I mean, it's based on a fascinating manuscript painting. Um, it's a, um, I, I saw a lot of paint, like miniature paintings that depict the river of life. And it's all, they're all pitch black. And it's such a striking you know, choice of palette. Um, and then I started to learn more about it. And I realized that they were actually not black. They were painted in silver that tarnished over time. So they were all silver rivers, but they became black because of time. Um, and the river of time 
I mean, the river of life to me is actually a river of time. So I wrote time there. <laughs> oh no, there. <laughs> uh, just, just more uh, pictures. I haven't had the chance to to edit the picture, so they're somewhat distorted. But you feel free to like walk into the space and experience the kind of uh, <laughs> a visual trip that you get from the reflections. Um, and then that's the word there is language, and just thinking about language could be a bird that it travels, that arrives in different places. Um, it's free. Um, hijran um, means longing in Persian. And I was talking to a lot of visitors here in the space, uh, and they asked me what it means. It seems that in Arabic it means to leave. And I think it's so beautiful because once you leave, you long for something. You long for what's absent. You long for what you bid farewell to. Um, and I think that really moves me. And when you look at the stars and you look at the moon, in Chinese poetry, when you look at the moon, you, you miss someone, you long for the absent, your beloved. Uh, and I think in, you know, in looking up to the vast cosmos, we become one as we long for the absent, whatever that's absent. And this particular painting is interesting to me because it's kind of a, uh, it's because I did all the work in London. I live in London. And I was reading so much of uh, you know, Arabic literature and Persian literature to the point that London becomes an Arabic country to me. <laughs> I started to see these ravens and be like, it's, and I think of like, you know, these birds in the conference of the birds. Like they have like certain kind of personalities. Like I, like reality and fiction merge all of a sudden in West London, I mean East London. Um, that's a very miraculous kind of experience. And I work till really late at night and, and, and this painting comes out of that experience of, of solitude, like complete supreme solitude of me like in London. And, and then I just have this like communion with the moon every night when I walk out of my studio uh, and I see her behind the, the fence. And, and the, that's the moon in, in Persian literature and poetry, Moh. This one should be the last one. Um, I also want to talk about it. So this one is also in the form of a manuscript. I don't know if you notice that I'm painting books. They're like pages. They're like pages. Some bound, some loose. These, this is a loose page. Um, and this one is inspired by um, knowing that Persian poets think of poetry as a pearl necklace. And each word is a pearl. And all the pearls are strung by meter and rhythm. And I was so amazed by you know, the, the idea, the visualization of that particular idea and thinking about poem as a as a necklace that it shines it um yeah and and but this is a this is my verse a broken one um that's it do you mind if we swap so i can see oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> otherwise i'll break my neck save all the clapping in the end Okay, so I'm going to talk about my approach and about my inspiration. Is it this one? Okay. Uh, so this is one of the most inspirational uh, quotes that I came across. And it actually changed my life. And I decided uh, to take that path and do geometry. After that, this is by um, Ikhwan al-Safa, 
uh, philosophers of the 11th century uh, from the Abbasids period. And it talks about why, um, so can, I'll read it to you. It says, know, O brother, that the study of sensible geometry leads to skill in all practical arts, while the study of intelligible ge geometry leads to skill in the intellectual arts, because this science is one of the gates through which we move to, to the knowledge of the essence of the soul, and that is the root of all knowledge. And I truly believe that the root of all knowledge is the soul. Um, this is uh, compositions of uh, Jalal Din Rumi, verses from his uh, poets, from his poems. Uh, the first one says, uh, in love be like the sun, and the second one says, uh, be humble as the earth. Um, and I think what I like to do here is, even if it's uh, readable, in this, in this artwork, but it's not the way people are used to write it. So it will take time for people to really uh, understand it and read it. It will take time for people to, it will, I mean, maybe I'm inviting people to contemplate the same way I, I do in life. So do all the native speakers able to read this? Sorry? Do all the because you you're telling you you just told us what does this means? Yes. And I'm just wondering, do native speaker able to just read I it? I mean, I don't know. Can someone read it at first glance, or maybe not? No. No. Okay. And again, this is the word "kun" from the same poem, and uh, I sometimes deconstruct the word, and I. I imagine that this word kun was folded and I opened it. Um, even the noon is not in the right direction as usual. So deconstructing the word is, is my passion because although language is um, abstract, I'm trying to abstract the abstract <laughs> a little bit more. Again, this is the word Allah. Maybe you can't read it from the first time, but it's written twice, once in silver and once in black. Mm -hmm. And they join together. So I, I make my own compositions when it comes to language. Uh, this is the word Hua. Uh, Hua, it's like he, but he, not he, a person, it's he, the divine. And um, I also like to work on uh, somehow on the visual ambiguity. So you don't know if it's coming in or out. Uh, it has so many different perspectives as well. So I look at the perspective of the words uh, as much as the construction of it. Um, Talking about Chinese and Arabic <laughs> uh, calligraphy, both cultures are very strong when it comes to, to the word. Yeah. And uh, the one on the right is actually uh, a Quran from, the, from China, and a very old Quran from China. And the one on the left is the 99 names of God. When I first saw these images, I thought I was looking at Chinese writing. I didn't know it was Arabic. And this, this fascinated me a lot because um, I saw how it got adapted in that society, in, the, in, uh, in that culture, and it became part of it. And that's how language evolves, especially the written one. Um, here I took just one element, which is the first in writing. It's the dot in Arabic letter. 
and I created compositions. And these compositions created a three-dimensional cube. But the cube is also not the way we see the cube because it's a little bit deconstructed. This is from the same series that um, I started in the year 2000. And when I say abstracting the abstract, I think I went so far with that because I created new codes for each Arabic letter to compose the 99 name of God. And I think there is, um, in, in spirituality, there is this relation between the finite and the infinite. Um, and I think for us in the Islamic thought, we have the one God that has the 99 names. And from this, these codes, I created the 99 names. So this is from the same, um, which is called the language of existence, because I was always interested in the inner uh, or the hidden rules of the creation rather than just the outwards of thing. This is the work that I have here at the Biennale. And for the first time, I created the, um, the alphabet, which is the codes, in a sculpture. Um, because language is also has the same uh, mathematical principle, which is the relation between the infinite and the finite and the infinite. If you start language with a dot, then it leads you to um, endless meanings and endless compositions. It will not stop. Its effect also on people will will not stop. It's it's. Uh... Um, here I wanted to talk about uh, what you mentioned about Western art as well. So. I think one of the most influential schools, of course, was the Bauhaus, and how they went back to basic shapes and basic colors and constructed everything from there. And this is uh, one of my favorite painters also, Victor Vazarelli, who's a master of optical illusion. Um, in Italy in the yeah. 50s and 60s. If you look at the one on the right, you will find a relation with the square Kufic that is from the old uh, Islamic uh, tr traditional writing. So I don't know if that is because it's a universal language or it's been inspired by it. Who knows? I think um, that it's both, that it's, it's yeah. universal. Be, um, and that's why people will probably make the same thing or become uh, drawn, or they're drawn to the same form of things. Yes. Um, but I, th I also think that, you know, there's like during the, uh, like the 18th and 19th, 19th century, uh, Oriental philosophies thought um, art and whatever that just you know kind of uh, arrived uh, mm. in abundance in in Europe, and I think we cannot ignore that historical fact that there's definitely a, an encounter between sure. two cultures, and sure. I'm sure artists uh, have seen things, even they didn't know what it was. Um, yeah, just like uh, you know the German. Uh, poet Goethe, he was he was reading like Hafiz, um, in you know in his time, and, and he changed his way of uh, writing poetry, and we just don't recognize uh, you know their Oriental influences so much because exactly you know, yeah. yeah. 
And Vasily Kandinsky, the first abstract painter, I think I mentioned his, uh, his books and his influence also mm -hmm. by the Islamic art principles. Paul Clay and the color theory. And Paul Clay went to uh, Tunisia and he was really inspired by the mosaic and inside the building. And I, you can see here that after he came back from Tunisia, all his paintings became little squares. M.C. Escher. So I am, I'm just mentioning the ones I really love. Uh, the Dutch uh, graphic artist, and also, I think it's it's the same mathematical. I mean, there's so so much mathematics behind his paintings that maybe you don't realize, but if someone will analyze it, you will see a lot of mathematics behind his paintings. And it's interesting he's using uh, fish as his exactly. vocabulary to. Yes to fill in the, the structure, the grammar of his, his universe. Exactly. And it also examines um, opposites, black and white, mm. uh, sea and bird, um, uh, fish and birds. That's it. <laughs> Um, so with the time we have, maybe I would like to open it up to the for great audiences here. If anyone have any questions for any of us, we would like to answer. Uh, good evening. I'm uh, Abiy Al Katam from Kuwait. Um, through the work of both of you. I think uh, we come to, uh, I come to uh, the um, conclusion that uh, through the work of Dr. Ibrahim Karim, the biogeometry, that we are one with the universe and we are just being connected through shapes, angles, you know, the golden ratio that we've seen in many of the compositions, it, that we are one with the universe. And all what we are trying to understand is the the language of God, of the language of the creator. And the language of the creator, it's angles, shapes, and numbers, you know? And the, that's how man was able to, to write it on the caves, on the walls of the caves, and then it evoluted to language and etc. But actually, the language we saw before, if you see in the pharaohs, in the Anka, in the old civilizations, in, in China, and all that stuff, early, early, cavemen, they had, the, there was no language. Actually, there were shapes, and they, uh, uh, pictures of animals, and then it evoluted. So what we're doing now is we're going back to the source, trying to find, going back to the original language of the universe, which was one, it was shapes. And we're trying to translate our language to the real language, which is actually shapes and forms and space, and because in that space, which is holding everything, everything is floating in that space, it can be only through shapes and, uh, um, and you know, the, the theory of, of, of how all those shapes mingle together in a complete vacuum. And what's that vacuum? And what's behind that vacuum? And this is, take you to, to, to the theory that there is a great, great engineer, you know, powerful, intelligent cosmos, you know, that we are trying to, to, to come back to our real knowledge. And I think through art, calligraphy, and all that stuff, the abstraction, you find it in children when they were not programmed. And now we're trying to come back to this, um, we're trying to take this labels that stuck on us, the labels and the programming that we had and that divided us into different civilizations, different languages, etc., to come back to this unity of mankind. And I think we are arriving to the golden age of spirituality, where now, where we're sitting here and discussing 
a Chinese artist with a Saudi artist, and actually they are unified in one language, and that's the language of the universe. And that makes us very happy because the, there's a universal doors that has opened lately, you know, for humanity uh, to become near and near to each other. Maybe that will be our salvation to peace and to humanity, to be recognizing ourselves without labels, whether this label is names or religions or, or, or whatever, or color or whatever it is. Um, I think that's why it's called uh, sacred geometry. Sacred geometry. Or al hundas al fadla, because it's not something really that we personal. Created. It's not personal. It's, it's we're divine. Just, we're just contemplating and realizing uh, what's around us. No, it's also but, telling us through biogeometry, which uh, the founder yes. of that is a great scientist, that the universe. We're we're tapping on this knowledge that exists around us in waves, you know, and shapes. And yeah. all what we knew, need to expand our consciousness. And that's what you said, knowledge and reading, all of that. Through expansion of our consciousness, we can connect with the, with the language of the universe. Exactly. I must say that uh, when I looked at your work, Thank you. I didn't know it was yours, because I didn't read the name, but I, I fell in love with it. I... Thank you. A lot of people <laughs> were saying like, it was like a Saudi <laughs> artist's work. Um, and I'm really happy to hear that because it's intentional of me to develop a work uh, that will make me disappear. I want to disappear. I, I want to, not that I want to be somebody else, but I want the work to be a space where there's no name. I understand you because this, it's the same with my work. I, I kind of want to get out of myself, of this moment that I live in, of the space around me. It's yeah. actually, it's, it's beyond time and space, the work we are trying to create. Yeah, and it's, it's, yeah, it's really interesting to think about how, you know, when you're making something as an artist, like for me as a painter, it, the hardest time is when you're dealing with your own ego. Yeah. And the, the image only happens when the ego is gone. You have to let go of what you want, of what you think you should be making, and let something else to come into this shell, this body that is the shell. Um, and that's when things happen, that's when creative, creativity happens. Yeah. I have um, a commentary and it can be a combined question. Regarding the subject, the reacting, the f fantastical. You've got a long journey with all different languages and its connection to religion. So you, s you started a journey and you're still continuing with it. And maybe you'll discover more things, which can be very, very, very interesting. On the other hand, I, because I've been following Lulwa's work, <clears throat> we all came to realize that she has created, she went back and created something totally new as a new language. It can be a language of the future, it can be the decoding of something for the future. So you've been moving forward with discovery while you went backward and you discovered something new, something uh, especially, especially for you. So can you explain more on this? I'd love to know more. I don't know if I'm going forward. I think I go in circles. <laughs> um, hmm? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, there's no time. Time doesn't exist. And time doesn't exist. Uh, then there's no history uh, nor future. It's always in the present. And I live in the present. And I search in the present. My present being, my present consciousness. Um, yeah, I don't really think about the future, but then I believe, but it's also valid to, to use this word. Um, I was also very inspired by uh, the poet, writer, T.S. Eliot, and in his, um, like, The Wasteland and The Four Cortes, and he's really just, you know, making, like, playing with words, especially past, present, future, and mixing them up in the, to the point that they're one thing. And I think I like the, the tawhid of time, of 
past, present, future. Um, yeah, I don't know if I answer your question. <laughs> I, I think time is an illusion as well. And um, what we're trying to do is, is uh, create something that is not specific to a certain time or a certain space. Um, Shay Azali, I don't know what the word in English. Eternal, Eternal exactly. So, you created a language which we also look you for branding. Uh, that is massive. And that's going to be a very long, long future. I think we keep searching as, I mean, that's what our souls are here for. It's just to search and to keep searching until the last moment of our lives. And as artists, I think, we look maybe deeper at things. Um, uh, sorry. Um, just thinking um, when you're saying searching, we keep searching. The soul is searching. And um, it immediately reminds me of the Conference of the Birds, yeah. where all these birds are searching for le their leader, Seymour. And then they travel across the ocean, the mountains, they die, they get injured, they give up, and then eventually they arrive at the shore where their leaders are supposed to be. And suddenly they realize that they are their own leaders. See more, 30 birds make the leader. So the soul seeks by going through a journey, but the answer is within. So um, for those who don't know the Conference of the Birds, it's actually a Persian uh, literature by Farid Din Attar. Uh, and it's a poem that uh, talks about the journey of these 30 birds. And at the end, I think one of them just survives. And because birds don't have leaders, uh, and all the other creatures have leaders, so they keep l looking for their leader. Um, and at the end, one of them just looks at his reflection in the, in the lake or the river, and he realizes, it hits him that, actually, your leader is within you. And this actually inspired so many literature and so many films and so many artists uh, around the world. One of them is Lion King, when he looked at his uh, reflection. 